This is On My Nightstand, and I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and today we are bringing you a reading um, from a book by this week's guest, Swan Huntley, and I'll tell you a little bit about her. Um, Swan is the author of Getting Clean with Stevie Green, The Goddesses, and We Could Be Beautiful. She earned her MFA at Columbia University and has received fellowships from McDowell and Yaddo. Her writings have appeared in Salon, The Rumpus, Go Magazine, and Mick Sweeney's Internet Tendency, among others. And she lives in Los Angeles. So uh, the book that I'm reading from is called Getting Clean with Stevie Green. I'm um, reading from the chapter called Stevie. Most of the chapters are actually called Stevie, but this is Stevie, Chapter 19. Want to know what I fell asleep thinking about? The inciting incident. I think it's time to tell you what happened. Ugh. It was an ordinary day. Isn't this always when disaster strikes, in ordinary days? Anyway, on this ordinary day, I arrived at school early as usual. I parked in the spot closest to the entrance. And just this, me arriving early to get that prime spot, was evidence of what a good kid I was or at least what a good kid I appeared to be. I was homecoming queen. I was on the honor roll. I drove a cool Jeep. My long hair was always straight ironed. I tucked my blouses into my jeans because a tuck-in gave the impression that I was wise beyond my years. A fully formed adult who just happened to be facing the technicality of high school. I was overcompensating, sure, but that's what a facade is, an overcompensation, and a deliberate one. My physical appearance said half of what I needed to say without my speaking, and my scholastic achievements said the rest. It's amazing how much you can get away with when people trust your presentation. Wear a good blouse. Tell them what they want to hear. Act the part. I thought it was easy, and it was easy. But I'd grown cocky and kind of lazy, not checking my angles carefully enough to make sure that no one was looking nor doing the extra credit assignments because I already had an A, so who cared? I leaned over to the passenger seat of my Jeep to do a bump of coke, which had become my new normal that fall. Just a little pick-me-up. This is what I said to myself every time I snorted that snowy powder. Afterward, I always thought, just a little pick-me-up. Sounds like a commercial for Burger King or something. Anyway, these are minor details. The major detail is that I started doing coke that summer and I couldn't stop. But because I was still performing at top level, it was fine. So just a little pick-me-up. Sounds like a commercial for Burger King or something. I swallowed the chemical numbness at the back of my throat, then looked at the poster tied to the fence. Stevie Green for president. All the letters were perfectly drawn because I'd drawn them perfectly. And that was why it was supposed to be a clear win because I was basically perfect, and also very popular. On top of looking the part, I was getting good grades, and I was also nice to everybody. Was this because I was a nice person? Or was it because I wanted to be popular? Did it matter? I took a few gulps of water and grabbed my messenger bag, which I carried instead of a backpack because it made me seem important and serious. And then I waltzed through the beige archway of La Jolla High like I owned the world. Soon, I'd be at Stanford, which had many beige archways, and they were grander and had lion statues on the sides. I just had to win the presidency, skate through the rest of the senior year, and then I'd be in Palo Alto. The end. There were a bunch of flyers on the ground. When did I notice this? I mean, I saw a paper, and a lot of it, but I didn't look too closely. I was busy owning the world. If I assumed anything, it was that the flyers were there for somebody's stupid band. But then that was a lot of paper, too much paper. The ground was almost white with paper, and it didn't stop once I'd waltzed through the archway. The flyers covered the entire campus like a blanket. Whoever had done this was very determined, and that determination inspired me to look closer. So I picked one up. I can't remember what I saw first. Was it the rolled-up 20 held between my fingers like a cigarette? Or was it Chris and I, mid-kiss? Maybe I saw it all at the same time, and it hit me like an early death. I know that because I stopped breathing. Oh, dang. 
It's that president chick, some dude said, standing by the science building to his friend. Hot, the friend said. Before they could see me, I flew out of there. As nonchalantly as possible, of course, even though I was on the verge of a panic attack. My feet were walking, then jogging back to the car. My head was down and my hair was flying around my face or floating underwater because it felt like time had slowed. My hand fumbled with the keys. It didn't feel like my hand. I drove through the mist without a plan and ended up at the cliffs, the spot where my dad... I can't talk about my dad yet. Let's talk about the aftermath. The short version of the aftermath goes like this. I lost the election to my former flame, Brad. I almost flunked out of school, and Stanford rejected me. Chris, meanwhile, came out, chopped her hair off, brought some Doc Martens and started doing slam poetry to express her feelings, and was awarded a scholarship to UPenn. Until that point, she responded to both Chris and Christina. After that point, she made Chris official. I avoided her like she was contagious for the rest of the year. Even though she never admitted to taking the photo or spreading the flyers, she was the only one who could have done it. No one else could have taken that photo because no one else was there that night and no one else wanted to ruin me as much as Chris Dane did. 